I'm Emily Martha Sorensen. I have 51 published books and about that many published short stories. For some reason, all my books right now are fantasy. All my published books are... I'll talk a little slower and then I won't trip over my words. <laughs> For some reason, all my published books right now are fantasy, even though science fiction is a third of what I write. So that's a bit odd. But I have a lot of science fiction short stories published. Um, one of them's in the Young Explorer's Adventure Guide, uh, Volume 5. And this is a really good anthology series, so I totally recommend it. Um, I ha also have one in Trace the Stars, the first LTUE anthology, and that one's also in my Magic and Mischief short story collection. So, yeah, I, I like science fiction. It's really fun. Thank you. JL? Yeah, Jim Curtis. I write uh, actually two series. I've got a science fiction series. I've got an urban fiction I just completed. And my first book in a Western series, 1870s Western, dropped yesterday on Amazon called Showdown on the River. I'm a retired naval officer, so uh, retired government employee, and now on a third career writing books. Hi, um, I'm Melinda Snodgrass. I'm a novelist um, and a screenwriter. Uh, the primary thing I have in science fiction is, in fact, a big uh, sort of space opera called The High Ground, starts with this book. and is a series, um, but I also uh, wrote for a television show um, <laughs> that you might have heard of called Star Trek The Next Generation. So that's sort of where I'm coming from with science fiction. Awesome. <laughs> Never heard of it. <laughs> Sarah? That's awesome. Um, so my name is Sarah Seeley. I write science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Um, I've also been writing more fantasy than science fiction lately, but I do have um, a, 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 it's kind of a long short story, but a techno thriller um, called Driveless that came out in Leading Edge a really long time ago, and I self-published it after I got the rights back. And um, it's about a paraplegic man who is in a self-driving car that goes rogue, and he's got uh, his baby daughter in the back seat, um, and. Uh, yeah, so I, I also, yeah, I write horror and I write fa fantasy and um, yeah, kind of a little bit of everything. Awesome. And I'm Charlie Pulsifer. I write science fiction and fantasy, mainly young adult. I'm also a cardboard sculptor and do a velociraptor impersonation. And I'm just a general nerd all around. So let's dive into one of the big features of nerddom and talk about science fiction. So how would you define hard and soft science fiction? Can I go for uh, it? So there are two definitions. The original defin hard science fiction, of course, is um, everything is scientifically accurate and based on real science. The original definition of soft science fiction was that it was based on the soft sciences, such as sociology and psychology. Whereas hard science fiction was based on the hard sciences, such as physics and biology. Nowadays, soft science fiction, is, science fiction is mainly used to describe science fiction that does not use accurate science. It's just playing around with science fiction settings. In other words, hand waving one or one. In other words. <laughs> yes, hand waving. Yeah. Hand waving. Yeah. 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 I agree with that definition. And uh, that pretty much puts a point on it. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think in some ways the discussion is, is kind of pointless. I mean, if any of us actually want to have spaceships and visiting distant planets and meeting aliens, we right off the bat are violating, you know, the speed of light issue. I mean, the minute we say we have faster than light speed drive, we've accepted the fact that we're going to play in a world that doesn't exist. And at this point, there's nothing indicated ever will exist. So I, I think that, you know, and, and I suppose I'm, I used to be a lawyer before I got better. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I don't, we, we don't address the fact that when we're writing, um, you know, I wish our field were more involved in telling me about economics and a legal system instead of just just wars. I mean, I think in some ways that can count as hard science fiction as well. You know, what does what does a future economic system look like? Um, what kind of political structure would a society form? And I think those are valid questions too, that 
don't necessarily have to be about physics or chemistry, but also have value and in what we do. Um, I just like to say, I don't think that you, I mean, hard science fiction is not impossible. It happens all the time. Um, for instance, look at the Martian. Um, that's, there's a lot of sci room for science fiction within our solar system that is hard science fiction and there there is no need to violate known science for that so and the expanse is another one yeah. that has guys have addressed a lot of issues so you know yes but if you're going to have you know faster than light speed i FDL, think yeah. way, we all <laughs> Well, that actually kind of moves into my next question, which is, can you share some examples of each soft and, and hard? Um, I tend to think of steampunk as being kind of an interesting category because um, it's it's very much a, a soft category in my mind because you're you're dealing with technology, but it's it's kind of magical technology. So you have like sentient uh, robots. Um, animals or something like that that are um, kind of part of it so there's like gears and cogs and you know anything that you know, it's more more about the appearance and sort of the time period um, than it is about anything to do with um, being accurate with uh, with technology um, so um, and actually I, I kind of think of Jules Verne even though Jules Verne wasn't you know, really doing steampunk, he was just doing kind of fantasy stuff, but uh, he's got, uh, it's it's kind of a soft science fiction in that there's, you know, there's technology with it that, you know, it's kind of fantastical. Um, it doesn't exist, but it's fun. It makes for a fun adventure. Even then, some of Jules Verne's stuff is is based on real science. I mean, you look at from the Earth to the Moon, and he got a lot of stuff right, mm -hmm. um, down to the idea that we needed to have a lightweight metal for a shuttle. And so he said we, it needs to be aluminum, and aluminum at the time was very, very precious metal, much more expensive than gold. So that was actually like a huge conflict in the book that it had to be made out of aluminum. <laughs> well, if you really go back to the '40s, Asimov, Clark, and Heinlein started the hard science fiction. The Moon is a Horse Mistress is definitely an example of hard science fiction. But I find it ironic that we're in the Ursula, Ursula Le Guin room, and she was probably the one that wrote the most of the soft science fiction in the early days, specifically mm. on the sociological aspects. True, but it's better than being in the Tolkien room for a hard science fiction panel. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> and whatnot um right you know, star so wars is straight out epic fantasy in a science fiction setting that sort of thing and then there's some books that are kind of like um it's more hard, hard science fiction but it's it's again stuff is there for an effect there's uh, a sense to it that's not uh, not quite real um like with michael Crichton books um you're dealing with um uh, things like Andromeda Strain, um, which is about kind of an alien virus coming to Earth and um, a set of science. So there's a lot of hard science and they're going through the process of, you know, they have an under underground bunker where they're trying to um, study this and uh, and contain it. So if something goes wrong, this bunker can explode. Um, but uh, th there's also kind of a, an element of, um, of course, kind of going beyond what we we know about the behavior of biological life and things like that. Um, and you get that as well with uh, Michael Crichton's uh, Jurassic Park books and things like that. Um, so it, it's interesting because some, it, it, you know, they're just because stories are speculative, you get um, some combination of reality, you know, real science kinds of things. And then, you know, it's kind of like, what part is the fantastic you know, fantastical part that uh, then we were going into for entertainment purposes. So, it's, yeah, it's kind of interesting looking at different kinds of stories. Yeah, you mentioned Michael Crichton. Um, he was a really cool example because he started out as a doctor. And so he had yeah. a lot of medical background, which is is fairly unusual. I mean, before that, we'd seen, say, Isaac Asimov, who had a physicist background, you know, so... Uh, that was pretty cool. I remember when I first saw Jurassic Park as a teenager, I was wowed by the idea of getting dinosaur DNA from mosquitoes. I had never thought mm -hmm. of that, and it just seemed totally brilliant. 
I wish we could actually like clone things that way. We it we would, can't. Be, That's nice. part of the challenge. <laughs> I know but they have proven since then that it can be done. But at the yeah. time he wrote it, it had not been proven yet that it could right. not be done. That was actually something that was theorized. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's that's one of the things that, that is brilliant about hard science fiction. You take something that's on the fridges, it seems like, from what we know in science, could be done. And then you come up with an interesting story based on it. And then that gets all the people who are working on the sciences to say, oh, my gosh, we've got to find out more about this. We've got to try this. We've got to do this. You know, it'll get all those teenagers and kids watching it if, if it's an appropriate for those ages to go, oh, I've got to go into science so we can do this for real. You know, that's that's one of the real joys of hard science fiction, I think, is it gets people really excited about real science. Yeah, it's actually kind of a nice feedback loop. Um, I know, as um, I didn't mention at the beginning that uh, I'm an archaeologist, but that is something that we talk about as scientists, or if you go into, uh, you know, if you look at a scientist's, you know, pop science book or something, there's usually references in there to science fiction, um, either literature or movies um, that inspire them or that, you know, they'll use it as an analogy in some way. That's really fascinating, kind of the connection between real world science that has inspired real scientists or that they can even use for analogies and stuff. Um, and science fiction um, and the possibilities with that hard science fiction. Even soft science fiction like Star Trek The Next Generation or the original Star Trek. Um, it, uh, tricorders, the, the concept of that has really excited people. And now there's, there's actually such a thing as real medical tricorders. Because doctors said, can, can we make that? Can we do something like that? That sounds cool. Yep, and the original communication devices that they flipped open, they actually modeled cell phones off of those. Oh, I didn't made, know that. Yeah, that's why we had flip phones, is because they modeled them after Star Trek. Makes and tablets. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, they, were, um, they were called Motorola StarTacs, and I carried one for a number of years. <laughs> and it was probably one of the best cell phones that I've ever had, including <laughs> the modern ones. Because yeah. it was developed using military technology, and the connection in it was actually based on a government radio system. So you either had a really good voice or nothing. True. Let's see. When I think of uh, soft science fiction, I think of The Host as one of my prime examples. <sighs> because it was science fiction, but it was very hand wave. I don't know exactly how stuff is done. Like that's the the way the character referred to things is like when I was this type of alien, I remember I knew how to do these things, but now that I'm human, I don't know exactly how it's done. And so she just kind of waved her hand over it, and it was very soft. It was still a really good book that I enjoyed, mm -hmm. but very soft. And then The Martian is a big example of hard science fiction where everything that happens within that novel, except for one thing, is pure real science that is capable of mapping it out, doing all the figures and, and showing how it works. I love your example of the host. In my opinion, that is by far and away Stephanie Meyer's best book. It is, it is really a phenomenal, phenomenal book. I love that book. Um, and uh, the thing that makes it need to be soft science fiction is that the science is not the answer to anything in the story. Everything in the story has to do with the psychology of the characters and the psychology that comes from this unique kind of species, what culture evolves from that species and what they're like. It's, it's very, very character centric. And um, that's, that's one thing that's a value with soft science fiction. I mean, you look at Brandon Sanderson's um, laws of magic systems, you know, with the hard magic systems things where he said um, uh, Sanderson's first law is something like... Um, your your ability to use magic to solve the plot is dependent on how well you have explained that magic early on. The same thing's true with hard science fiction. Um, if science is going to save the day or it's going to have anything to do with saving the day, it, it had better be part of the central conflict. It had better be there all through the story and it had better be done right. But if the whole thing is based on characters and psychology or sociology, 
you, it can be hard science fiction, but it doesn't have to be. You look at Isaac Asimov's Foundation trilogy, for instance, and the whole thing is based on sociology and psychology. And yeah, the the science is fine. I mean, it's Isaac Asimov, you know, master of hard science fiction. But the story could have been equally good as a soft science fiction thing, um, because that's the focus was on the characters. Is there a middle ground? Is there a over medium? science fiction most science fiction is <laughs> <laughs> i would say so too i would agree with that too yeah what are the strengths and limitations of doing soft science fiction so i think um again it's uh, um like um emily was talking about with um setting up uh, uh, uh yeah she she covered a lot of uh, characteristics of both hard and soft science fiction, but I think um, with uh, with hard science fiction, um, yeah, you you need to set up um, how the details of the science are going to play into the central conflict of the story. Um, whereas with soft science fiction, um, you might need to focus more on the characters and character development. Like I absolutely feel like that hits it on the head for. Um, some of the differences there, or some other kind of conflict. Um, you know, you're, you're maybe it's an adventure story, and you're trying to retrieve something from the bad guy who stole something, or you know. So the technology's in the background. Um, yeah, yeah. You can spend extra time on details that don't matter to the plot, especially if it's cool. The rule of cool makes anything work. But you don't need to, and sometimes if what you're going for is a faster-paced story, it's stronger not to. Well, I tend to agree with Melissa, what she said earlier, about using things other than the standard tropes, shall we say, mm -hmm. by bringing in the financial, bringing in how the governments get built, because that can be a real good piece of the backstory that gives you the conflict that you want through the story. I tend to feel that Osa well, versus also, Scott Card is, oh, go on. I was going to say that I'm actually going to talk about this in this keynote thing I'm going to do, but I'll throw it out here too. I think one of the strengths of science fiction and, and even, you know, obviously fantasy as well, but certainly science fiction is, I think it's a very safe place for people to explore a very difficult topic. And in some ways, to me, that's what makes science fiction soft is when you say, OK, we're going to talk about racism. We're going to talk about bigotry. We're going to talk about these these issues, but we're going to talk about it in the example of aliens on a distant planet. And it makes it a safe place to explore that and kind of explore your own feelings about it in a place where it's not in your fate. And, and I think that's one thing that our genre has over you know, many of the others is that we can bring up very difficult questions in an entertaining way. And, and you know, as far as, um, I mean, I would like to think that hard science fiction also has great characters. I mean, if you don't have characters, I don't think you've got anything, um, ultimately, because we only read to find out about other people and how other people would react and how other people feel and, and how that reflects on my life and what it says about the human heart. And so if you can have all the great whiz bang science in the world, but ultimately, if you don't have core people at the heart of your story, I think, especially now, because we have a very sophisticated um, audience after 60 years of 70 years of television and movies and, and books. And I don't think the kind of, you know, old fashioned, you know, um, manly men and supportive women, you know, doing <laughs> noble things with science is going to play anymore. And so I think we've got to, you, we've got to have people at the heart of these stories, whatever they are. Yeah. I was going to say Orson Scott card strikes me as quite brilliant at um, the sociological aspects of things of how cultures interact. Um, I would say that's probably his greatest strength as a writer. He's really, really good at that. Okay. Any other comments on strengths and limitations of each form? Of science fiction? I would say um, one of the great strengths of hard science fiction, it's a limitation and a strength both, is the fact that you are limited to real science. Because here's the thing, 
real science is interesting and weird. And when you start researching it, you suddenly start realizing that the world is weird. <laughs> then you get really cool story ideas. And the thing is, when you really, really do your research on, on hard science, on real science, and you start coming up with story ideas in which the plot is influenced by what the science says, you start coming up with unique plot twists and unique premises that nobody's explored before because it's not based on tropes. It's not based on what you have read and what you are influenced by and what you are you've culturally used to it's based on what the science says and so you you can wind up with some really unique really interesting stories by following the science thank you i think i, I was going to say that I, I think one of the choices we have to make as writers you know i certainly do as a screenwriter is what do you put in and what do you leave out um i mean you know do you really want to there's so much that's happening in you know brain research and you know uh, possibility of AI and all of these questions, and as you're creating a story and a culture, you may not want to have to put all of that in. And so I think there have to one of the choices we have to make is is to be is to be clever about what we leave in and what we take out. Um, what does it work with this plot, this story that I want to tell? Um, you know, I hate to be self-referential, but you know, I really didn't want to get to AI. Um, and, and nanotechnology. So I came up with a reason why um, they fear it and they don't develop either of those things because that wasn't, that wasn't what I wanted to talk about. And, and sometimes knowing what to leave out is just as valuable as what you put in. Yeah, that's, that's very much true. And having worked in the R&D world, I've seen some of that, seen some of the things that... Uh, as we call them, the aliens in the basement over DARPA were developing. <laughs> and AI, just like drones, has, has a set of balances. The problem is nobody's really gotten that right yet. So I actually wrote a short story about that, that <clears throat> set in the future where the AIs basically are not allowed to become sentient because of the fear of them taking control. And that's something that they're actually running into today. If you go look at any of the videos like Boston Dynamics, good example, robotics, <clears throat> those things think for themselves when they're performing. So number of ways to play it, what you leave in, what you take out, as she said. I, AI is a really, really interesting one because that's something we don't know enough about. We're trying to figure it out because we don't even understand how the human brain works yet. And that's just, it's the intersection of hard science and psychology. It's cool. And, and then there are all these moral questions inherent in AI, like what is a person? Does this count as a person? And, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, there's, I would say if you, if you want to explain explore AI, one of the most important things to research is AI safety research. Um, because there are like a hundred different opinions. Like you find a hundred different AI safety specialists and they will each have a completely different opinion. <laughs> they can't agree on anything. But because of that, that means the field is ripe for playing. And it's also where you're going to have an intersection of law as well. I mean Elon Musk has been lobbying Congress very energetically to pass laws to limit research in AI because he's honestly tremendously concerned about it. So, you know, there's, again, it takes us into a direction of things that we don't necessarily think of as fiction, but it really, it really is. And in terms of humanity, yeah, I've kind of written about that. <laughs> I did that on track with the measure of a man and data, you know, what, uh, what is a person? So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's the ultimate question. But, you know, I love the fact that this is being placed before governments to say, do we allow this research? Is this too dangerous? And why? Um, and what limits do we place? Cool. Well, Jim, what, did you one have more something? Thing. Sorry. Oh, it's Jim, good. Looked, Jim looked like he was going to say something. Okay. 
Sarah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, just one more thing to add, um, just in terms of just the storytelling part. Um, so I think one challenging one challenge that you can have with hard science fiction, um, kind of similar to um, an epic fantasy or something like that, is you can get, um, and, and this is kind of building on what Melinda was talking about with, um, you know, you could. Um, uh, you know, have you, you have to figure out where to to cut off the information because there's there's so much information. Um, so kind of like with epic fantasy, you can uh, go into trying to you know spend you can spend too much time trying to build up your world. Um, and at some point, you need to bring the characters into focus and figure out a conflict. Um, and uh, how the characters are gonna um plug into the conflict with with the science in the story. Um, so yeah, so I've, just kind of solidifying Melinda, what Melinda talked about earlier. And I've seen science fiction books that actually have like pages and pages of formulas and things. And I'm like, I love science, but I'm not that much in love with that kind of science. I, I want the story. I want the characters, but, uh, there are, there is a small audience that loves super hard science and will read those type of books, but I am not that audience. Mm -hmm. yeah. I gave up doing math when I retired. I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> well, an interesting thing with um, just in terms of characters um, with Michael Crichton, um, just going back to him, just because he's uh, he's does some interesting things with characters. Because um, a lot of times what he wants you to do with the story is focus on the problem that's going on with the technology rather than on the characters. Um, so he, he does some rather sort of cold things where you start off with a set of characters at the beginning of the story that are kind of living their lives. And then they intersect with the science problem. Um, so at the beginning of Jurassic Park, um, you have a couple of different sets of characters. So there's like a family that's on a beach and the little girl gets mauled by a dinosaur and then there's another scientist in, in Costa Rica who's just there at a clinic um, uh, a doctor at a, at a clinic out there and they get some random workers in who have some really serious um, bite marks on them and then you don't you know there's enough there that you could get attached to those characters but then what he does is you don't see those characters ever again it's just there to set up some suspense for the problem with the technology uh, aspect um, of the story. Um, and then he moves into other people who are going to um, spend the rest of the book addressing that problem. Um, so just that's just kind of an interesting storytelling style in terms of, uh, you know, getting, getting the reader to focus on the problem as opposed to attaching to the characters. You know, I've got to admit, Crichton makes me roll my eyes into the back of my head. I mean, you know, it's, there is some technology man was not meant to know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Except that ultimately the problem always comes down to somebody doing something stupid. I mean, yes. you know, Jurassic Park, yes. that guy turns off the power to the gates. Okay. Um, the one where they travel in time travel, you know, crazy Marine brings a grenade, you know, it causes the problem. And I'm sort of like, why then do you blame the technology when in fact the problem is people behaving badly? Um, and this if that's is what true. you want to talk about, great, but don't tell me the technology is in and of itself dangerous. I mean, that's, this is true. I, you know, of course, I just brought up Elon Musk being worried about AI, but he's not saying never research it. He's just saying we should have constraints on it. So, you know, make sure that this guy doesn't turn off the power to the fences in Jurassic Park. No problem. Um, so yeah, that's yeah. why I'm really not that fond of writing that sort of like, oh, you know. That's true. Yeah, I do consider him more of like a horror author because it is more about like, you know, things go wrong because people are selfish and corrupt and they're doing things for their own gain. And that's why the science gets messed up. It's not because the science itself has to be inherently evil. Um, I mean, I also just for fun to talk about it, I saw a kind of a mock uh, series that was kind of trying to, it, it was clearly inspired by Jurassic Park, but it was trying instead to kind of simulate what you would see at like a wildlife reserve where they have uh, they've, you know, they make it like they went back in time and they got a bunch of dinosaurs and, you know, and it's like a, a sanctuary where they're trying to take care of them and, and basically they're, you, you know, it's like if you're watching someone at a zoo and it's like well this this animal is 
in heat and he's having, he's really grumpy and he's attacking everything. And so we're trying to come up with a solution so that, um, uh, you know, he has something to fight with or, you know, something to calm him down or I, I don't know. So they, so they treat it like, you know, we're, we're at a real life wildlife reserve and we're, we're gonna, you know, that we're, acting like we're professionals who are interacting with the dinosaurs and trying to help them as opposed to, yeah, kind of the intrigue that you see with Michael Crichton's book where it's more about people, everything gets messed up because people are corrupt kind of a thing. So yeah, there's different ways that uh, you can definitely go with, <laughs> with those kinds of stories, depending on how you want to do the entertainment with it. Okay. So where do you find, cool. Where do you find the science that you inject into your fiction? Well, for me, I've got friends in the business, so to speak, plus some NASA folks that I know. And uh, I will get ideas from them. I'll get papers from them that are as yet not published, uh, plus 13 years doing R&D for the government. So I can draw on things that I've actually worked with. He just casually drops like, oh, just some NASA friends. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I can give you names if you want them. <laughs> hey, hey, I wrote some music for NASA. <laughs> they gave me, a, it was an internship and they gave me five grand to write music that they didn't do anything with, which was kind of sad. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we're getting back to... <laughs> <laughs> One place um, I that I go, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I look, um, I look for interesting articles and see, you know, what sparks my attention, you know, what, how can I use that to talk about, explicate something about the human condition, um, and its usage. But you know, thank God for for all these scientific, you know, journals and magazines that are out there. For sure. I like watching educational YouTube videos because it's something I can do while I'm doing art because I like doing art. Uh, it's also something I can do while eating because I don't like sitting at a table. I like sitting at my computer <laughs> while I eat. Um, it's, it's also something I can do while I'm cleaning, which is something that I'm always in need of doing. <laughs> Such a mess. Um, I have kids, but I'm also a slob. Um <laughs> And um, these these videos, you know, take five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, sometimes sometimes even 30, you know, to watch a video on something really interesting. And it gets you thinking. Um, I have a children's fantasy series that I started because I read an article on the Today I Found Out website, which also has a YouTube video, but I didn't discover that until later, about um, all the different senses humans have. It's more than just five. It's closer to 20. And I thought cool. I, I, I love edutainment games. And I thought, why not write an edutainment fantasy series? You see hard science fiction all the time, but you don't often see real science used in fantasy. So, you know, I went and wrote this series <laughs> um, all, all about, you know, each, each character can sense fairies with a different sense and all 20 different senses are represented. Um, and and that's what I mean by follow the science, because the science is so much more interesting than the expected. <laughs> I was going to say, I, oh. No, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I was going to say, I love, um, I love science books. Um, and, and um, I don't know, I, I just read a lot of nonfiction. That's actually my preference, um, because I am a scientist, and so I like to see what books people have published lately um, within my field, within uh, paleontology or ar uh, paleolithic archaeology, um, human origins kinds of, of books. Um, in part, I kind of want to see like, um, you know, they're, they're taking big concepts and they're making it digestible for a, a common audience. And I want to see how well they actually do that um, or whether, you know, the, the book isn't that good at doing some of that. And I, you know, so if someone asks me, you know, have you heard of this book? I can say, um, yeah, I, I read part of it and yeah, it's pretty good. Or I can say, um, yeah, it's very, very basic. And um, I, I don't know. I didn't find it quite as, quite as interesting. I feel like they've repeated what other people have done, you know, things like that. 
Um, so yeah, so I have my own reasons for reading uh, nonfiction books, but I think there's a lot of fodder there. Um, one of my favorite nonfiction books um, is actually a little bit, uh, it, it sort of combines uh, literature and, and anthropology and other kinds of sciences, but it's called Rabid. And it's about the history of rabies and how that actually, you know, probably intersects with a lot of um, uh, mythologies about um, uh, werewolves and vampires um, and things like that. Um, and just kind of how different cultures dealt with rabies. Um, so there's some interesting books that just kind of um, it, it intersects science and uh, um storytelling from past generations that that i find really interesting so yeah there's lots of uh um yeah i i really like science books um that's that's a place i like to go popular science books for yeah, ideas I, I don't have nasa friends so i use google scholar a lot i like looking up the clinical trials and the research papers and digging through them i said that i don't like that in the books, but I do like doing that that research before I write a book and make sure that I include some solid science li lightly touched when I actually write. Well, that's that's a big part of it is, uh, and again, picking on what Melissa said, you've got to know what you're talking about to be able to get it right in a small enough dose that the average person is going to understand it without doing an info dump. Yep, and without no. making their brains go numb. Yeah. yeah. No, I, uh, the Turkey City lexicon puts it pretty well. They said, you know, one of the please don't do this is I have suffered for my research and now you're <laughs> going to suffer too. <laughs> you know, because I'm going to be wrong. <laughs> you know, so, you know, don't do that. <laughs> um, you know, I, info dump or don't make people suffer for your research. Yeah. Another place you can go for research is you can interview experts. I did that for my Dragon Egg series because I had decided, because apparently I'm a glutton for punishment, that I was going to set it in the 1920s and have everything about the dragons based on real paleontology. Because in this dinosaur, this world, all dinosaurs were actually dragons. It's actually technically hard science fiction because there's no actual magic in it. But try telling people that it has dragons. So I just put it on the fantasy shelf. Um, <laughs> but I, I, everything in it, everything in it is based on science and real paleontology. And I had to... I went to several dinosaur museums and talked to paleontologists who work there and asked them specific questions. I mean, um, I, Dionychus, I think is the name of the dinosaur. Am I saying that right? You know? Dionychus. Anyway, that's Dionychus. Yeah, that's, that's the dinosaur that my dragons are based on. That is what they are. And, um, you know, I, I had to find pale, some paleontologists who actually knew a lot about that species because I couldn't find answers on Google or Wikipedia or anywhere. I had to actually go to someone who knew and I'm like, how long is their lifespan? You know, how long does it take them to grow from, you know, hatching to adulthood? You know, things like that. Um, they just couldn't find those resources without interviewing an expert. So if you want to do hard science, sometimes the answer is go to a museum or go to, you know, a, a college. Just find someone there who knows this field really well and have, you know, a few questions. I tried asking like 40 questions and that didn't go over so well, but five questions goes over just fine with an expert, especially when they can give you like a two sentence answer. <laughs> Sweet. Well, it looks like we have about 10 minutes left. So let's open it up to questions from the audience. We have a question Hopefully. from, we have a question from Joe Vasicek who asks, what do you think of the idea that the genre went through a dark age after the new wave and is only now climbing out of it with indie publishing, speaking specifically of hard science fiction. Well, I'll jump on that one. I think that's the truth. Traditional publishers, by necessity, have narrowed down who they promote and how they promote them. Indie science fiction has allowed anybody that wants to write science fiction to write it and publish it. And I think when you see the differences not necessarily in quality, because some of the stuff traditional publishers put out was not the greatest. I mean, we got we got to admit that. But with indie, now you can pretty much pick and choose any style of science fiction you want to read. And that has brought us back up on the upswing. 
we're still playing catch up to romance. I mean, they're the winners in the whole thing anyway. Can't can't but, compete with romance. No. But I think that Andy has that is the thing about boost. That is the thing about indie publishing is that when there are no gatekeepers, um, the small niches can get the chance to actually be published. And when hard science fiction wasn't and anything that's not currently on the edge of being popular is rather hard to get traditionally published. Um, but an author who loves that and who says there's a hole in the market, there's a hole. I love this story. Nobody's telling this story. I'm going to write it and I'm going to publish it and I'm going to find people who love it too. Um, yeah, in, indie publishing is wonderful for anything that's niche. We have another question from Edge Dancer 07 with respects to Star Trek. Where would it be a good place to get hard information on muting inertia? Melinda, you. You're... I don't totally understand the question. Muting inertia? Um... Oh, okay. Um, inertia, inertial you know, dampeners, the whole inertial dampeners so, thing. Yeah, I, you know, I have to assume that it's the fact that we had gravity on the ships and it's made a plot, you know, and the fact that um, we can't afford to have people in free fall. Um, I mean, if you'll notice whenever you see something that's shot with people in free fall, one of the things they never do because it's just terrible pain for production is hair, you know, hair is supposed to float. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, some of it is just the reality of, you know, you're shooting a weekly television show. So you kind of have to go, yeah, we invented this thing and it does the thing. And we don't have any, I mean, that was one of the problems when we were on the show is every time an episode would air, there would be like a thousand messages with people saying, yes, but you know, and the warp drive and the, you know, frack that. And we were like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, we make it up, okay? Um, and then if we could, we would pass it on to, you know, Okuda and Sternbach, who wrote the technical manual for the Star Trek, and go, here, you guys answer that, you know, please. <laughs> um, so I can't address it other than what it's like to be filming for television, so. Actually, one of the things, depending on how deep you want to go into it that you could look at, is accelerometers and uh, three-ring laser gyros, things like that, because those are, are things that actually do mitigate uh, inertia to a certain extent. So, and that mm -hmm. developmental work is being done on larger and larger scales. Um, you look at Saturn V, for example, or even better yet, look at what Musk is doing now with uh, with the current rockets that he's putting up. Those are being driven in a lot of cases by inertial compensation through accelerometers and ring laser gyros. And I'd yeah. like to say this is one of the things that soft science fiction does that is of value. You take something that seems impossible by the science we know now, but it sounds so cool and so practical. Inertial dampeners are one of those. FTL is another. It sounds cool. It fires people's imaginations. They don't care if it's impossible. They want to figure out how to make it possible. And that inspires generations yeah the, the problem with hard science when it comes to or inertial dampeners and things like that is be, that essentially they are gravitational drives and we don't right. fully understand how gravity works still what causes <laughs> it how to create it and so creating the hard science behind it is very difficult and finding hard research behind it because we don't really know yet we don't understand it if only Einstein had been able to figure out how gravity fit with the other fundamental forces, science would be very different today. <laughs> Extending that idea, uh, Michael Hawley asks, what additional sources can we turn to to learn about the new tech, science, and discoveries that we all can include in our stories? So um, if, you, if you're interested in like seeing the latest research that comes out, um, a lot of people who are working on big science projects will often do press releases with different news organizations. Um, but if you want to subscribe to um, Science or Nature magazine, um, they'll, ha they'll feature a lot of um, the latest uh, research in a lot of different areas of science. Um, so it could be um, 
tech biotechnology it could be um archaeology related it could be neuroscience um so they have a nice collection of different kinds of of um really big research that people are working on so um and that's fun and you you'll get like a, a weekly email from them if you subscribe to their uh their um email list um so that's kind of nice a nice place to get some ideas yeah nasa is another good place uh, also, your applied research labs, University of Applied Research Labs, uh, <clears throat> Johns Hopkins, UW, Texas, Pennsylvania, State College, and a couple others that are doing advanced research, they will put out occasionally put out a quarterly review. I, I would are. also say there's no reason not to hang. Well, there is now coronavirus, but there's no reason normally not to hang out on a college campus and look for people to chat with who are professors in the department you want to research or even, you know, people getting a PhD or a master's degree or even a bachelor's degree in that field. My father-in-law is uh, an English professor who specializes in um Everything Dan Brown got wrong. <laughs> That's like his specialty. And he's like, if the guy had just shown up and asked me a few questions, I would have talked to him for four hours about this subject because I love it. And I can talk about every detail. <laughs> and, you know, it's it, scientists are the same way. We get People get excited about the things they love. And they often are really excited to have the opportunity to help somebody else get it right in a story. Because, I mean... We're all nerds here. <laughs> we want the thing we love to be done right. It's cool. There are a couple blogs that I follow that release new things all the time. Um, one is uh, nextbigfuture.com, um, Kurz, kurzweilai.net, singularityhub.com, uh, gizmag.com. There are a couple places. And then there are quite a few YouTube channels that do very similar things that release new things all the time. Okay, we're at our last minute, so everybody just uh, share a little bit of your final thoughts and about yourselves, and we'll go from there. All right, I guess I'll go first. Um, use science. It's cool. Research stuff. You, you don't have to have, like, research it if you have a specific target, but research it if you just want to find out interesting stuff. Figure out what you find interesting. Deep dive into it. Write down any story and ideas you get. Do more research on it. Because the closer you get to accurate science, the more fun it is, no matter what genre it is. Yeah. Um, look up look up cool stuff. Um, look up stuff in science that interests you. Um, and then uh, as you're reading about it, think about a conflict that you could uh, include. Like um, you're reading about the latest, um, uh, you know, like what I did with my story, reading about driveless cars, it's like, what could go wrong with a driveless car? Mm -hmm. So you can look at some of the latest research that people are doing um, or experimental work and just think about a conflict that you could introduce to that science. Just study it. I mean, we're living in a time, you know, we're becoming scientifically enormously ignorant. Um, and I find that appalling. We cannot continue to deal with the problems that face us if we don't understand the technology that hopefully is going to save us. So um, please spend time, embrace it, learn about it. And I would just echo that. I'd say learn about it, write about it, and make sure you get it right. 